Hello and um, welcome to my presentation on co-producing an explanatory framework for a social movement in community sport. My name is Louise Mansfield. I'm a professor of sport health and social sciences at Brunel University London. I'm also vice dean for research and um, I'm going to be talking about a particular project that I've been involved in uh, for the past two months uh, in Southall, which is a community physical activity project. Um, and just particularly talking about building an explanatory framework um, in that project. So um, I've been working uh, in Southall for the past 24 months. I'm an ethnographer um, and heavily involved in community physical activity and, and sport projects, working really closely with community teams um, involving policymakers, commissioners and managers, project leads, people who participate, volunteers, um, and um, really exploring how to build evidence to inform policy and practice decisions in communities focused on sport and physical activity. But in this project, um, more broadly than that, around how the local community communicate um, with policymakers and decision makers, how they're enabled to do that, um, how joint decision making can be supported in the local community. Um, and and decision making around a whole range of wider decisions than physical activity connected to infrastructure, travel and transport um, and, and those kind of things. And I work really closely with Rajinder Singh, who's head of transformation at Let's Go Southall, and Jess Val Gill, who's head of delivery um, at Let's Go Southall. So this is a, um, a collaborative uh, um, presentation, despite me um, doing the presentation. Um, I think the first thing to say really is that in any community work that I do, than I've been doing for the past 15 years, what's centrally important is to get to know your community, to be what I will call involved in some way, shape or form. And um, for people that don't know, Southall is a ward in the West London Borough of Ealing. You can see its position there in relation to London and then in the smaller diagram in relation um, to the UK. And it is a culturally diverse community. I actually live in Ealing, which is very, very close, but very different to Southall. Um, I would credit this project with getting me back on my bike, actually, and cycling from Ealing to Uxbridge to get to work at, um, at Brunel. Um, but importantly, um, getting to know the community, becoming involved in the community to do this kind of work is really, really central. Um, and it's very difficult. Um, I think it's a long-term process. It involves collaboration, as you'll see, um, in terms of the development of this explanatory framework. And it really does involve you in having a, a cultural understanding about identities, identity politics, um, and, and the history of a place. This doesn't mean that you will be, um, you will become an, an insider or part of the community. There is this delicate, I guess, ebb and flow between in doing evaluation and research between being inside and outside the community and, and treading that path, um, but recognising where that leads you to be able to learn something really important and where it means that you don't know enough. And that's really, really important. I mean, just as a kind of backdrop, Southall is a major town in West London, as I've showed you on the diagrams. It's got a long, rich and difficult history, actually, around migration and immigration um, some of that internally, much of it external, some of it forced. I mean, in the 70s, expulsion of the Indian population in Uganda um, uh, led to the development of particular cultural community in Southall. It, it has a major South Asian culture. 70% um, um, of, of the culture is Punjabi. Um, and, and it has really experienced its, um, its share of racial tensions and pejorative terms that have been levied at it. And I think that that culture of distrust in outsiders and authorities um, is a central thing to know and to understand and to work with and through um, in, in Southall. Um, so I was connected to Southall a couple of years ago from some other work that I've been doing in another local London borough. Somebody knew me from that work and um, connected me with Rajinda and, and Jasper. And we had some kind of what I would call insight conversations about what, what the community were trying to do and why, what the challenges were, um, where I could help, where there might be challenges in me helping. And the remit really was that the community itself through Rajinda and Jaspal had created and successfully won an award from Sport England for what Sport England have be, uh, been calling their local delivery pilot. So these are regionally 
funded project looking to increase physical activity through community sport, um, but take, uh, I guess, a larger scale system wide approach, or at least embed systems thinking into where physical activity and community sport fit into the system of public health, particularly. Um, and in this program, you know, what has become to light is that um, the, the projects, the physical activity and the community sport Pro programs, interventions, if you if you want to call them that, actually sit in the wider system of public health and well-being, but also sit within other contexts in the system to do with education, um, regeneration, um, travel and transport, and have a, no less a significant influence on things like environmental um, issues and, and climate change. So it is way more than physical activity and sport. But when I was first involved, the conversations um, were about this successful award, and that had been built on broadly what the community would uh, were calling a social movement. There wasn't a um, fixed definition of it, other than that it was a very much community driven approach, and that it had a strong leadership model in there that was around the community taking responsibility for and using their personal community values to drive the project. So um, it was really about the encouraging engagement of the community into this model of working, um, being involved and amplifying, I guess is how I would call it, the, the voices of the community in the successes and the challenges of the project. There was certainly a focus on system thinking and system change. I think this is a common approach in public health or it has become a common approach in public health to explore how community sport and physical activity sit within the system of public health broadly, but in the wider network as I've described, and, and what the drivers and blocks are within the system for success of um, effective physical activity and sport delivery. And, and the project was radical from the outset. It is radical. The, the whole focus has been on really radically changing, changing and addressing poor health in, in a community um, and doing that through the lens of racialized tensions and inequalities. The, the quest has been for a transformative shift to community leadership um, and a public narrative approach to community leadership, actually, uh, in this respect. And it really is framed by people's lived experience. That's the driver of the movement and building system change and using community leadership in order to do that. I think it's also important, and you will have got this from the things that I've said here, is that the research that I've been involved in, that I've led, um, is collaborative. I'm, I'm, I've been doing this kind of research for a long time. I have a certain set of skills that are relevant and hopefully um, important and useful to this project and support the project to be able to build evidence in a way that they couldn't do on their own for lack of capacity or um, just inexperience in, in doing it. And so it has been about building the research, but also sharing expertise in that respect. And for the future, thinking about how the community can embed evaluation into the project as part of the principles of social movement, which are about sharing learning. So, but the aim in this collaborative research was really about um, co-producing the evidence about the value of thinking in a system-wide approach and a social movement approach to increasing physical activity. And the focus has been on improving public life in, in a community context. And so I've been doing 24 months of ethnographic uh, work, which has involved all sorts of different techniques. I mean, I've, I would argue now that this is a, a collage approach to research um, methods. I'm not necessarily going to go through all the methods in, in the project, but it's involved months of observations of mobile methods, cycling my bike and walking with people, um, informal conversations, going to um, more formal meetings that are held as part of the movement approach and um, in being involved in the working groups, developing a system of research huddles where we could pull out key questions and issues that needed a little bit of an airing in order to take them forward. And we had a big digital storytelling uh, project within that as well. And I think within all of this, it's really important to position the whole project in terms of creating and developing healthy and sustainable places and communities, um, which reflects the Marmot um, Review on the First Society and Healthy Lives. I'm not going to labour this slide, but it's just for anyone who might be interested in the academic perspective and how that translates into a more practical approach of collecting evidence. Um, you know, the, the approach for me is, is around becoming involved. It's about 
really challenging and understanding the limits of one way conversation, you know, where you go and say to people, you know, look at look at this project. What do you think of my project? But but that does come um, with some heavy labor and some really intense reflective work around building in more creative and participatory approaches crossing what I call crossing borders and sectors, even in a small local authority, you know, we're talking to people from transport and planning who focus on safety, parks and recreations who focus on regeneration, and, and people who live in the communities who, who, who want to be heard about health and about access and facilities um, and equity in that regard. There is a really nice piece in here around shared learning, around it being a space for what I would call public pedagogy, you know, learning how to work with communities in a, a, an ethical and respectful way to uh, create social change. So that's kind of my academic perspective, but it translates really um, into practical action within communities, not just for me, but for the people that I work with. And it kind of looks like this. I, it's always really difficult to get across, unless you work in communities, what the what the everyday experience of an evaluator is and of a participant and of someone making strategic decisions um in this kind of work but you you know there is so much going on that we've had uh, and i it was only me doing this in the first instance uh, you know trying to get involved from bike mechanics uh, um opportunities to the new development of a number of outdoor gyms by the outdoor gym company. I mean, if you look on any day of the week in Southall, there are opportunities to take part in a whole suite of activities from Bollywood dancing, online weights, outdoor gyms, canal walking um, and, and cycling. Um, and the growth of that has been, in my view, quite unbelievable. So, from a culture, particularly let's take biking, from a culture of no bikes, they've gone to a suite of two to three opportunities to train on a bike, you know, do some cycle practice, go on an independent ride, um, get some qualifications on riding a bike, access to bike mechanics. And I think my point here is, is that it, the complexity is really, really important when building anything around evidence in a community and actually in the design and implementation um, of, of any community sport and physical activity project. And I think that's true of public health projects broadly in communities. And you have to get involved. These are just some more pictures of what it looks like just to kind of give you a feel of it. Um, in terms of data, again, I don't need to, to do too much detail around this. There's lots of it. There were seven overlap, overlapping sources for this explanatory framework. Um, there's been primary data collected, interviews, observations, as I said before. We did a digital story uh, package. We've done some secondary analysis. So what's been, I always know this, but um, often I'm not involved in projects for as long. We've written lots of reports on basis of lots of data. And I think it's important to remember what's in those reports. And we've gone back and done some secondary analysis of those reports and of data previously collected. So there's a lot of data. It's all qualitative. Um, and we've taken a broadly thematic analysis if people want to know in building this explanatory framework. And I can talk to that in the questions. So what's an explanatory framework? Um, well, like I said, the social movement wasn't conceived within a specific or defined theory. And that's OK. It was iterative. It was, you know, what we might call inductive. It, it developed from the ground up. But the issue with that is that it's difficult to explain it to people who are making decisions about the project. And so we needed to find a way of articulating the evolving principles that were there. And the explanatory framework was developed as a way of doing that. So it was really kind of about reimagining and explaining the nature and contribution of the South or context, because context is everything in this and it's everything in explanatory work um, in the social movement approach for implementing effective and sustained community sport and physical activity. And just a little bit on explanatory frameworks, they're kind of, they're, they're a little bit like theories of change, but I guess a bit more strategic in terms of the way they're set out. And this had to be the starting point. But what they're brilliant in doing is describing and understanding complex and unclear actions and relationships, which is what we were faced with to start with. They center the context. It's all about understanding what's happening in place 
in this particular place. That doesn't mean it's not transferable to other places, but every time you use the principles in another place, you have to understand the local. And that is one of the key kind of pillars. It's about explaining relationships and actions and emo emotions over time as they, and the dynamics of those and things do change. So your explanatory framework has to be capable of coping with that complexity lens. It, it explains multiple interaction effects and it looks like this. So when I put this up, I'm always just not nervous, but I look at it and I go, that is a really looks like a really oversimplified version of two years of work on one page. <laughs> but we have to find a way of translating all the evidence in that two year project so that this kind of thing can be shared with people who are making decisions. And so this was how we did it. And, you know, I'd be interested to know whether people have had this experience and whether or not this is another way to do it. I mean, we've thought about animating this and I think that also might be an interesting way. I think we have to, first of all, I mean, this has now been reported to Sport England and um, it will go to an executive board for the project. You have to agree whether it's right or not before you start, you know, doing that sharing. But I think we are at this moment where it does need to be shared in ways that I would call useful and usable for different audiences. So we now have five pillars or foundations that explain this, this particular social movement. And those concern these things. The principle of health systems innovation is really central. There is a shared vision in this project that is committed to transforming community health systems through physical activity of any kind. And that is a shared commitment actually at all levels. Sport England, obviously, the borough want to do it and South Hall really are um, committed and passionate about this approach. And I've, there's loads of quotes from different people in this project that, that show that, you know, we need change for health. Physical activity was not a key part of our community lives. I think we've heard that a lot and um, we've heard it a lot in the bike project. You know, this was not a culture where cycling was, um, that where cycling was a part of it. Um, and in fact, there was, a, and still is, quite a lot of resistance to bike riding. And yet the bike project has been successful and there's all sorts of opportunities for riding bikes and, and having a bike free in in uh, uh, in South Lawn. And these are in no particular order. They are, they are just what explains the project and the social movement approach and they underpin why it works. The second pillar is around place, space, locality and culture. Like I said before, this is about South Hall. Context is everything here and you have to understand the ways that a sense of living and growing up in Southall influences local action, because it's actually local action that creates the processes by which all this works. And those two key processes, a collaboration and partnership and leadership and organisation. I'm going to start with leadership and organisation because it's not a typical leadership model. People don't come with particular skills or learn particular skills or get qualification in order to lead. It's a self-organizing model. And it is based on a shared public narrative about health systems innovation and about sustainable transformation. So all of these kind of interconnect. Um, it's based on people in the community having a sense of responsibility for their own and other people's health and well-being and feeling also responsible for taking some control in that and sharing how it's done. I mean, the, group, the, the project works in teams. They have organizers and super organizers that do take a lead in a classic way. But actually the role of much, more, much less tangible uh, leadership approaches is really, really central. People know each other. They share the project with each other. They get involved, sometimes for short periods of time, sometimes for longer periods of time. They bring their skills. They help other people develop their skills. Uh, and so it's, I, I hesitate to call it distributed leadership because it's not that either. It's a much more uh, focused approach around self-organization and leadership and, a, and responsibility for community public health in that respect. Partnerships and collaborations are central. They are in a lot of projects. But this is about co-creating an open and transparent culture of the way things are done and sharing learning and development between individuals in the project, but also with partners. They've got partners with Rally, West London Waste, the Met Police, 
for recycling bikes, for example. Um, and I would say that the London Borough of Ealing are a partner because there's so many sectors that feed into that. And then this is, uh, this is um, very much focused on sustainable transformation. It's difficult to do, but the focus is on new ways of working. It's not about doing things the same top down with you know, the council dictating what money comes in and how it all happens. It is very, very much about collaborating and sharing processes for making the public health system work better in the community and using community support and physical activity for that purpose. So these are all brilliant as principles and everybody agrees them. <laughs> and then the question is, okay, if they explain how the project works, how do we actually use these in order to implement community sport and physical activity effectively or to make decisions at a council-led level or a sport England level and that's a 64 million dollar question and we have not resolved that completely but one way in which we've I guess I guess the way we're influencing strategic decision making to ensure these things happen is through a series of what we call readiness guides so these are another set of visualizations. They don't tell you how to do things, but they identify what I would call causal mechanisms within the project. And we've used if then because statements here for each of these five pillars to show that, the, and this is really fascinating to me about social science and social sociological orientated research, that we're often resistant to talk about cause and effect, and we probably shouldn't be, but actually we build a lot of high quality evidence on which we can base some pretty confident decisions that if we do something, something is likely to happen because we've done that thing. And that's what I would call a causal mechanism. So these, these readiness guides provide, provide this foundation for the system to think about how they can implement the pillars. I think the next step, and I don't want to use the word toolkit, um, but it's kind of like that. I think the next step is for the community to use the framework and the readiness guides to have a series of, I mean, it could be workshops, it could be training packages, it could be a guide that is the how-to, that, that is a set of clear, I guess, examples of how you can implement this process. But I think we've gone a long way and we have a good framework for making this happen. So this is a kind of introductory slide for the readiness movements. Uh, the readiness guides uh, in the movement, there are five of them to reflect the five pillars, and they all start with a statement that reflects the definition of the um, of the pillar. And so I guess they are there to sensitize people who are going and I get this a lot. Well, what is this social movement and how does it work? They sensitize people to this is the way it works. And if you want it to work, you have to ask yourself these questions. So do you share? a vision for improving community health through community sports and physical activity. Do you see physical activity as really central to public health? I mean, not a lot of people say no to that, but there's still quite a lot of, well, you know, it's better if you take some medicine or a pill or, so there's still a disconnect, I think, with the value of sport for changing people's healthy lives. Um, it's not necessarily always the go-to thing. It makes com it's common sense. It's not always common practice, and I think I think there's still some messaging to be do done in public health around that. Um, if you are using this social movement principle, are you connected to and really valuing the local community in which you work? Key question. Um, on collaboration and partnership, this is about reciprocity. Do you know the people you're working with and are you prepared to really collaborate with them in design and delivery? And that can be really hard because people have different objectives, different working practices. I mean, working with schools, for example, is difficult. Um, but, you, you know, there has to be an openness to collaborating. Um, I think on leadership, people have to be reflect on whether they believe an alternative way of leading that involves communities is something they want and something they're prepared to commit to and trust. There's a lot of trust in that question. And then, you know, the sustainable transformation question is really about new ways of working. Are you really committed to doing new ways of working or are you gonna end up doing things just exactly the same as you've ever done? So those are the sensitizing questions in the readiness movement. And 
I'll take you through one or two of these and then we can we like you know eventually not quite yet we can share the slides and you can you can have a look at the others because they're quite detailed but let's let's maybe start with the leadership now let's start with the place and locality because I think it's a key aspect of Sport England's approach you know the all of this is is place based and people will you'll probably understand it so there's a lot of work in the design here, which is also really interesting. It costs money. We are in a position at Brunel to um, not offer, offer it totally in kind, but we've got a huge design department with brilliant master students on that programme. And we have an employment system at Brunel where we can employ design master students to help with these things. I, I think it's incredibly difficult to do otherwise. You know, I think. Local authorities do have designers, but they're few and far between. So get, you know, having time to do these things on these projects is difficult. But this, these kind of um, readiness guides, again, not in any particular order. We've tried to use the arrows as wiggly ones to show that there might be some directional stuff here, but it might be the other way. And like I said, these really identify causal mechanisms in three levels of causation. Um, the, the if question, if you do this, this is likely to happen. Remember, this is all evidence led. This hasn't sort of been made up as something that, that sounds good. It's driven by the evidence in huge 40 page reports that I've written. But in terms of place and locality, there are kind of three broad areas, if you like, around strategic decision making. One is a model of active listening. You know, if you are in the community involved, hearing what communities do, understanding their histories, I mean, and it really does have to go to that level. That's when you'll make more effective change in communities around health, because you embed some sort of co-design and collaborative approach that is for the community in which you're working. It sounds so common sense when I I don't know, articulate it like that, but it really is not common practice. And the conversations with people in communities and particularly in Southall are that they have had a history of not being listened to by the local authority. Um, so I think that that has been really, really important. I said before, just in this left hand kind of kidney shaped beam thing, uh, that there is th this idea of building long-term trusted relationships and trusting relationships with local communities is absolutely fundamental. If there's no trust between decision makers and communities, you're at an impasse. Nothing really gets done. Everybody feels feels that you're not talking to each other and, and, and things fall apart. And I think building trust has been a challenge in this project all the way through, and it's taking a long time to do, which is not unusual, uh, but it needs to be the focus because when you trust people, it enables them, it empowers them to have meaningful conversations. They'll just be much more genuine and authentic in what they want to say to you. And that's not always, that doesn't always mean you're gonna hear good things. And when I show you an example of the active travel consultation that has used these principles, the notes from that show arguments about whether or not cycling was right for this community, whether people wanted a cycling lane here. You have to be prepared to hear that stuff as a strategic decision maker. And that's what a social movement approach can give you. Um, because it reflects real world experiences. And I think this sort of public pedagogy approach, this informal learning, le learning about other people, learning to trust, learning where you can make a difference and where you want to make a difference just brings a depth to what you know. And it also brings a sustainability because of that depth. And when you really are genuinely listening to people, and um, making decisions on the basis of, of those voices, um, uh, things are much more sustainable. In all of this, I'm not romanticizing it. You can't please all of the people all of the time, but I think this is a much more ethically framed and genuinely, uh, as genuine potential of long-term success than many other approaches that I've seen. So there's five of these. I'm not gonna go through them. I'm just gonna show you what we are. Okay, I've got probably got a, five more minutes um i just want to show you an example of those kind of print those principles in practice um and then we can we can i guess have a discussion so this also demonstrates that those pillars don't always sit as nice separate pillars they interlock and they you know that's how the project works but this is an example of some emergent impact and it's an example of a situation where the london borough of Ealing was going to be doing its um, 
developing its active travel uh, strategy and it wanted to consult with the community around active travel and it particularly wanted to consult with Southall. And the regeneration, principal regeneration officer who was leading on this had been part of the development of this social movement approach to um, uh, community sport in Southall because the project has been set up as a series of working groups and it invited all stakeholders to those working groups. So this person leading this active travel um, consultation was on those working groups and had been for at least a year before this particular um, consultation was needed. And remember, the local authorities um, spent quite a lot of money on consultancy for these things. And this was the response of this regeneration officer when we were talking about the role of the social movement in the consultation. And I'll read it out because I think it's really important. The connection to the social movement was a way of opening doors to the community for better system success. And sh this person worked in active travel. People question our cycling infrastructure in Southall, saying no one rides bikes. LRS, which is Let's Ride Southall, disproves that. There is a passion for cycling, but the bike is a symbol of low value, and that makes it difficult for people to speak up about positive views of cycling. It was clear to me that if we could tap into the social movement, I could reach more people for the consultation and therefore get a more informed view. And it represented what was called what this person described as active travel togetherness. So what they did was they paid the South Hall Community Social Movement Group to act as the conduit for the consultation for businesses and individuals in communities in South Hall around the active travel strategy. And this was not light touch. This involved engagement, co-design and early engagement with the social movement group, as I've said, advertising consultation events, then conducting them, going to faith location visits, doing walking tours, there were drop-in sessions, there was an exhibition about active travel located in um, Southall, there were online workshops, co-design workshops, it was not light touch. And it was large scale. There were 11 consultation events led by the community 580 people engaged, 530 responses to an online survey. And this is not a community that is particularly good at online survey, surveys. 280 businesses engaged. These were door-to-door -door things that the community were leading. And this is a bit fuzzy, sorry, but it looks like this. You can see that, you know, they started it on the 20th of April, 23, um, and it took till June 23 but you can see the kind of trajectory and pattern of involvement with talking to people in communities. And the outcome was just better evidence about what people thought of active travel. And um, in that respect, it, it, it's demonstrative of um, the success of a community-driven, led community-led approach to working with communities across all sorts of sectors. This one just is about active travel. Okay, just a, some concluding comments, I guess. It's not easy. I'm not saying this is all perfect and brilliant. And, you know, wow, what a great thing we've done here. It, it's contested daily, on a daily basis. I mean, I've just been in South Hall this morning talking to the mechanics who have essentially, in the Gurdwara car park, built a hub for the cycling project. And um, it's incredible what they've done, but I, the whole terrain is contested. Um, it's difficult to get messages into entrenched systems and decision-making organizations. There's capacity and resource issues everywhere. There's, you know, it, it needs constant support from the system in order for it to work. Although actually today I thought, I think this will carry on um, in some way, shape or form, but it doesn't require, you know, it does require resourcing and it requires valuing. I think when I first started, there was very variable understanding of what social movement approach meant. And that's why we've tried to build an explanatory framework. Um, I think we're at a watershed moment where we can now share that explanatory framework within the communities, with Sport England more broadly, with other local authorities to see whether it can work for them. But that needs time. It needs trust building and it needs a rollout program for the explanatory framework. And we're not there yet. Um, what I would say, though, is that the phased co-production approach has been central to supporting the explanatory framework. And I think that evidence building has also been important in 
making the social movement known. I think there's a case for embedding the evaluation better so that it's ev sort of everybody's business in the project and that there are ways in which local communities can lead the evaluation. That would That's my wish for the next step. It's definitely embedded into the local, it's place-based, it, it uses these organizers and super organizers who take responsibility and responsibility is really what underpins what is called a public narrative approach to leadership. It's about people's personal values and community values. It's that which stimulates and supports others into action. It's very storytelling based in that respect. And it has led to what I would call effective, inclusive and quite extensive programming, um, it, it, not just in, in one form of sport, although the kind of cycling project is the flagship project, but in a whole other series of projects. You know, I've been to ladies only gentle exercise classes on a Friday morning at the local Christian church and you can't, there's not a spare space in, in that and that happens regularly and they do other things and it really is about community connection and I do think it's growing participation in a way that wasn't possible prior to the exception of the social movement. I think that is the impact of this project. I think there's more work to do here, which is my final comment about positioning the explanatory framework and the movement approach in the system. It is positioned in the wider borough context. People do know about it and they are interested in it and they do come to the working group meetings. And that's exactly the case for Sport England. I think it's that next sort of difficult step of system thinkers taking a wholesale acceptance of the movement approach, valuing it, trusting it, and supporting it and resourcing it for a sustainable approach in the long term. And that's always the, always the difficult thing. And that's it. Uh, right, Louise, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, for somebody who's interested in this sort of thing, I mean, that's really very, very interesting to me. But, um, and I, there's lots of questions I'd like to ask. Um, but first of all, I'd like to um, ask, do we have any questions from our audience? It's interesting what you're describing. I'm involved in a exercise for neurological conditions piece of work that's developing developed in West Cheshire. Mm. It's kind of extending across Cheshire and Merseyside, so it's quite mm. focused. But he's trying to engage with local leisure services and other opportunities and things like that. Um, and I, and and I understand the point about the social movement, but I guess you talked about resources quite a lot. <laughs> And it's a really hard one because, yeah. you know, there isn't direct funding for this kind of work. Mm. I mean, the impact in terms of neuro conditions, one in six people live with a neurological condition. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, it's one of the few things that's been shown to repair neurons is exercise mm. in mm. that area. Mm. So it's massive in terms of, you know, and we've got yeah. people who are living with the conditions who are involved in the project. But mm. it it's a real uphill slog mm. Mm. yeah the benefits of this recognized yeah yeah just wondered how you kind of enabled that to happen yeah I mean I feel your pain um I think one of the emerging areas in this project is with public health teams that's not that you know they're so difficult to work with the mm. work is difficult in the way you've just explained mm. and I, I wouldn't argue that a social movement approach is the right approach for every project and every context. It, it, it is context specific, Ruth, and this is how it is working and has been and is being successful in Southall. Mm. Whether, I don't think you can pick it up wholesale and drop it somewhere else. I think you have to do that work to go, well, what is the local context? Who are these local people? And I think in the situation you've described, where you've got very specific health conditions, where those people can't lead anything for themselves, they need massive amounts of specialist stakeholder support, I think that's a different type of project potentially. No less resource intensive, but I just, I don't, I wouldn't say that a social movement approach is necessarily right in, in that context. It, it's very, you know, specific. Mm. Um, you know, I think in those contexts, Ruth, again, from my experience, you definitely need all that collaboration and partnership. Yeah. Um, you need, but you need, of a very specific type with specialist stakeholders, be that from allied health professionals or delivery 
physical activity deliverers who know about delivering to physical activity and health. I mean, we we did this, I'm not necessarily saying it was successful, in a project in Hounslow a few years ago. Again, it was a Sport England project. I can send you a link. It's called the Health in Sport Engagement Project. And, but we'd, we, it wasn't a social movement project, but it was definitely a complex community sport project with multiple stakeholders. And I think what underpinned any success in that project was knowing the stakeholders like you will do and ensuring that that kind of stakeholder approach was embedded um, as effectively as it possibly could be. Um, yeah, I mean, the, lot, the, the more complex the health conditions, the more resources are needed, and it therefore starts looking expensive if you see it in a traditional cost model. What we've tried to argue to support England in those situations, not in this project, is that you you have to look at economics in a much more complex way yeah. but it's, it's difficult yeah <laughs> uh beth First, yeah could i yeah. raise a question um louise I, I, i'm beth cousins i work in wales uh, on the whole systems approach to healthy weight mm. across um two university health board areas um and one of and we work with a nine step um uh, process in that whole systems approach but one of the things that has concerned me about the methodology we use from the outset has been yeah. you know the, the connection with communities because much of the stakeholder um, mapping and systems mapping at the beginning of this whole process starts at a fairly strategic level um, and, and my concern is yes it's all well and good doing that but <laughs> But where is the community voice, com community involvement ongoing? You know, all the things you, you've talked about already within that. But, you know, one of the questions that is often posed is, but if we did it that way, there would be significant cost capacity needed to do it that way. Mm. And 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 what would what more would that give us <laughs> in terms of, you know, value added yeah. um, in, in that whole process? So what, one of the questions I wanted to pose to you is, is has that question been asked of this project yeah. and program, um, you know, in terms of what does success look like yeah. for the founders, yeah. Yeah. you know? The, so just to explore that a bit. Really, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. Really great, key. great question, Beth. You know, I think I think just as a framing thing on systems thinking, I think it's something that's sort of used and, and uh, sometimes without thinking deeply about what that actually means. I mean, at the basic level, it's trying to understand complexity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so you ought to have all stakeholder voices in there somehow, right? In this project, those questions haven't been asked because it was bid for as a community voice project. Okay. So at its fundamental core, even though they couldn't, there wasn't a theory of social movement, that's what the bid was for. It was completely uh, upfront and open with an aim of working with the community to develop a mechanism of designing and de delivery for, for the community that would be set in the whole system, but it started there. And I hate to okay. use the word bottom up because actually people in the community, yeah. some were working in the council yeah. and, you yeah. know, but, but that question wasn't asked at the start and it, it hasn't been asked because I also think, and this is where context is, is everything, the local authority have been thinking about ways to do this for a little bit before this came in. And that had been borne out of a long history of tension between the local authority and a number of wards around them. And so, um, you know, the idea that people felt that they you know, weren't being listened to, the critique of the council and all the rest of it mm. had sensitized um, the council to listening to these things. If I'm honest, I think there was probably an influence of the Black Lives Matters campaign um, in terms of the importance of listening to community voices. Um, I'm not sure whether anyone would necessarily, you know, say that was a cause, but I think it was a moment in time that reinforced some of the things that were being thought anyway. Um, there are other sort of consultation, there has and is other consultation work in the London Borough of Ealing with communities in different ways, but this was the first and is the only one to take a particular approach called a social movement. And the council are looking at it seriously as a way to do things. That said, um, 
there are always questions about cost and capacity. You know, these things get funded initially and then they swell and they grow and people get drawn into things. I mean, we found this as an evaluation team and, you know, you, you need and want to go to something else that might not have been thought of. Um, you know, it, it's, it has to be strategically, it has to be thought of going forward. It's why I now think that the models of evaluation in the kind of projects that you're probably involved in needs to be an embedded part of the project, not an add-on. And however that gets done, whether it's someone who's employed as an insight manager and they manage a group of community volunteers, citizen scientists, you can have peer researchers. I, do, it, I don't think, it, however it's done, it needs to be done. And I don't think that's a model because the other thing, and I know I'm biased because biased I'm a researcher, but there's so many examples where the evaluation approach and the evidence actually supports the, the implementation because you're getting a message across or you're getting people to think about what's working and what's not working. So I think there's added value in doing it in doing it that way. Yeah, and the insight you gather, as you said, as you go through the process itself, yeah. isn't it? You know, helps you adapt. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Okay. Should I pick up this question in the yeah, in the chat from, from Deborah, yeah. Um okay, so it's a it's about creating and sustaining whole systems approaches, trust and the fundamental pillars. Yeah, I mean just just to say yes, I you know when people were talking about trust initially, they were going, Oh, can we get trust into a question on a survey? And I said, well, you can, and there's lots of questions on trust, but I don't think that's going to give you answers about how trust and trusting relationships need to and can be built in a project like this as part of, like you've said, the fundamental um, fundamental pillar. And I think more work needs to now be done in disseminating this framework and talking about this framework. And, you know, it's not a fixed framework. I think it will shift and change. I think the language will need to shift and change, but it is a starting point. Um, and I think uh, you have to give people working in these projects some time to get things right. I think, you know, one of the challenges of a sort of overarching and independent evaluation that doesn't really work within um, the project as we've tried to do is that you um, you are you, you ask the right questions but you often ask them at the wrong time so you know people feel under pressure to get an answer to your question or to answer the question the way that they want you to hear it when actually the work has not had time to mature there is a maturity aspect to this on sharing the, spl the slides, yeah, I'm more than happy to share the slides. I do have to wait until an executive board on the 4th of March. So they will come out just a little bit later than this presentation. And then there's a question on comments on the social mechanisms of the movement itself, more abstract mechanisms in the social movement. Yeah, I mean, like I said, this is about emotions, behaviours and relationships. And I think one of the things on in terms of kind of abstract mechanisms that really gets forgotten, particularly in behavior change approaches, is that it's emotion that underpins behavior, really. And that emotion comes from your experiences, the situation you find yourself in in life, your histories, your biography and your social life. And I think we can tend to become over-focused on changing a behavior and not understanding the emotions that underpin that. And that's, you know, one of the challenges of trust because it's sort of intangible, isn't it? And um, um, and so are feelings, but they are absolutely central to engagement in sport and physical activity and engagement in anything really. And I think they're really under, under evidenced, if that's a phrase. <laughs> okay. Um, there's... Uh... Something that I'd like to ask uh, yeah. an, 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 an organisation that you haven't particularly talked about, but um, obviously we've got this new thing from the NHS, integrated care system, integrated yeah. care boards. What interest have they shown in this? Yes, yeah, such an interesting question, Paul. Um, so we're obviously we've got a college of health medicine life sciences we have a network of academic and health practitioner um, networks and we're well aware of the ics the ics is very big in our area i think it includes nine boroughs and there has been little involvement directly in this project 
probably because of its local connotations and because the public health relationships are emerging and developing. And so the answer is very little. Whether I think that's right, the answer is no. I think we need to get much more embedded with the ICS, but there are challenges in the Northwest ICS around its, its sheer size. Mm. Um, and so we need a mechanism, and I think that probably will emerge over time of being interconnected with them. You know, the, the, there are some ICSs that are much more well-developed and connected to universities actually, and doing sort of local policy innovation and community and creative health. You're probably aware of Creative mm. Health Network out, out, run out of UCL. So some are doing it, but not all. I think it's quite fractured, but I do think it's really important. Mm. Yeah, and that would be one group that I would want to be, you know, presenting this to, to see and explore its relevance. And, and there will be people on the Penn Network who will be members of yeah. the Genetic Care Board. Yeah, uh, yeah. John, you've got a question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just um, on the issue of integrated care organisations. Yeah. I'm John Movena. I'm the facilitator for Greater Manchester's Older People's Equality Panel. And obviously that's the integrated care partnership in, Man in Greater Manchester, something that's yeah. been around for, for a while now, yeah. for five, six years. And as you say, it covers a wide area. It's, it's ten boroughs, up in Greater Manchester. Um, I think there's a lot of work that is being done to ensure that the integrated partnership is involved in projects like this, like GM yeah. moving, for example. And all of the panels in Greater Manchester are involved in, in projects like this. I just wanted to say thanks for this really interesting project. Thank you. And more than that, it's interesting how successful uh, the co-production work was yeah. in terms of, of people getting involved. You know what the outcomes of that are. Obviously, you, you've sort of given some examples of really positive outcomes, but mm. it's inevitably it's always really, really difficult to get co-production yeah. that people believe in. Yeah, and that's the key to it, isn't it? Is is that the starting point? You, you described a little bit of the tension between the community and uh, you know the people that are making yeah. The decisions. Yeah, yeah. And what we hear all the time is, well, what's the point in getting involved in this? Because we never get any feedback. We never hear anything that that outcomes based on what we said or I can yeah. see that yeah so it, it just the whole thing sounds really positive and really interesting so I just yeah. wanted to say that. yeah I mean we've we're not there yet John we still mm. hear that yeah. um there is and I, and I don't think that the, the community team would mind me saying this there is some reticence around evaluation itself you know particularly the survey method which um is it can be useful but you can't just stick one in willy-nilly um and and hope it, it will work so um and i get that and i and i do think that um if evaluators are not prepared to actually get involved or can't get involved um that it's a poorer evaluation for it but i do think there's also this this sort of like i talked about this public pedagogy this learning how to make sense of your project in in a meaningful way i'm really about meaningful measurement and i don't think it has to be the professional costly evaluator that has to do it i i think our role is also to share our learning on things that can pragmatically work and i think in that space you'll probably have a need for a bit of professional evaluation but also the other kind of more um you know citizen science as i'd call it or peer research or in between and the two things then can align and that's i think how you um how you do that best okay uh louise well we're just coming up to um two o'clock yeah um um i i mean i'd just like to thank you very much for taking the time to do this i know it's been, uh i found it ex extremely interesting i know that people on the hen network will find it if, will have found it interesting um and um you know, maybe you'll come back and talk when you get confirmation from Sport England that the project's going to go going to go a little bit further. Now, what what I'd like is someone here to do the net do another presentation where this has been useful and they've used it and it's sort of oh, spread. Right. That that would be the ultimate, right? <laughs> well, well, uh, well, uh, we might be able to help you there. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. Thanks everybody for attending. Thanks for your time, and uh, Louise, you know, thanks once again. Perfect. Okay. Thanks Goodbye, all. Bye, everybody.